Γεια σας. In the summer of 1927, when I left from Perea, I took a vow that if ever the opportunity presented itself in the afterlife of returning the goodness and hospitality that I'd seen in my peaceful travels in Greece and in Crete, I should try to serve your country with a love equal to that which every man owes to his own. Those words are from my late grandfather. That's him. And uh, the fact that he wanted to like, do anything he could for Greece is not something that hangs over me oppressively, but it does make it in some way more of an honor to present here today. So, I'm going to talk to you about something that's really, really deep to my heart, and that's food. I wake up in the morning having dreamt about foods that I might eat in the future, foods that couldn't even exist, foods that I've eaten in the past, favorite meals, worst meals, snacks. I spend my day preoccupied by what I might have for breakfast, what I might have for lunch, dinner, all the snacks in between, which wine, which coffee, which beer. This really is running my life, this thing. And that's all very well. It's great to think lots about food. But it gets much more difficult when I start thinking about the future. In my eyes, there's a war going on. There's a war between people who want to have real food, preserve real human culture, preserve traditional production systems, preserve indigenous networks of food communities. Between those people and people that want to make profit, they're not incompatible. But if you have entirely profit-driven industrial food systems, it leads to some pretty big disasters. So this is a, just a little bit of figures to start us off. We've got 70% of the world's agricultural resources being used to feed 30% of the people. These are the latest statistics from ETC. The that leaves, of course, 30% of the agricultural resources to feed the other 70%. And that happens through complex networks of traditional farming methods and, uh, traditional, farming methods and traditional uh, techniques of exchanging and sharing and all sorts of other things that go on. The reason people want to control our food, though, is deeper than just making profit, I believe. If you control people's food, you control their life expectancy. You control their fertility. You control the demand for pharmaceutical drugs. You control the likelihood of getting type 2 diabetes, of becoming obese, of being malnourished, of starving, of having micronutrient deficiencies. You control a lot more than just some calories on a plate. When we're talking about industrial food systems, we really are talking about these kinds of beastly realities that we see here. Huge, huge monoculture. This fact up at the top here, this is the FAO statistic. The 12 plants and five animals provide 75% of our food. Now, why is it that we're using 12 plants when we have some two and a half thousand edible plants, and we're using 12 to provide all of this. It's really crazy. We're thinking about the animals as well. We, we have five animals providing all of our food. Just to give you the statistics, just to like put it in numbers, you have 97% of the research being done on poultry 
is being done by four companies. And at the same time that those four companies are driving all of this research, we're losing six animal breeds every month. Every single month. It's really crazy. That's more than one a week. So, what is it like? How can we get away from this kind of horrible, beastly monoculture system and start looking towards a more diverse future? Diversity is our starting point. It's the, it's the end and it's also the means. It forms a loop of feedback through what we do, mediated by ecology, necessity, appetite. And diversity is the cloth that weaves us all together and is upon which we, we share our meals. I want you all to stop for a second now. And I want you to think of the most delicious thing you can think of. Your own personal ambrosial nectar. I want you to hold it in your mind's eye. Keep it there. Imagine the way it smells. Imagine the way you're enticed to bring that into your mouth and to become one with it. And eventually you do. You put it in your mouth. You swallow. And you feel this almost orgasmic pleasure going up into your head. Now I want you to hold on to that food. And now imagine that you have to eat that same food every breakfast, every lunch, and every dinner for the rest of your life. It's disgusting. <laughs> it doesn't matter what it is. It could be foie gras or rice. It doesn't matter. It's disgusting. And this is like just one like very, very clear example about how we need diversity in our diets. Our whole diet system is based on uh, needing different nutrients for our bodies. And if we accept diversity as the kind of like starting point for all this talk about deliciousness and all this talk about moving forward with good tasting food, there's a, a, a sort of tricky concept. I call it the mango paradox. So here's some lovely tropical fruit in a, the market in uh, Barcelona. I love mangoes, you know. I, I live in Denmark, I work in, uh, I work in Denmark. I'm from Scotland, from Edinburgh, and I love mangoes. And we do get mangoes there, but they don't grow there, of course. And uh, it's really easy for me to think that somehow I'm increasing my dietary diversity by having a mango, right? So before I didn't have a mango, now I have a mango, so the diversity increased. But it's an illusion. It's a complete illusion. If you take away that mango, you start to look introspectively into your own ecological niche where you live, where we all live, in different ecological niches. And when we take away the mango from, from the, my diet in Denmark, then suddenly I'm forced to look around me, to find wild plants. And I come across, for example, sea buckthorn, which is a plant that grows around the beaches where I live and uh, has these beautiful little orange berries, and they taste like incredibly tropical. It's beautiful flavor. When I take away that mango, I start looking at all the different varieties of apples and realizing what a myriad of different flavors that they bring with them. I don't need that mango. And actually, to think that it's bringing some kind of increase in diversity, when we think about the fact that almost all of those mangoes, whether I'm in Edinburgh or if I'm in Denmark, they're all coming from Pakistan. There's huge tracts of land in Pakistan full of Alfonso mangoes. They're all the same mango because it's all for a mass market. So actually, by removing it from, from uh, my diet in Denmark, I'm not anti-Pakistani mangoes. I love them. They're beautiful. But by removing it from my diet, we're actually encouraging biodiversity there and encouraging us to look at our own nature that around, that's around us and bringing something good forth. So I want to talk to you about the tongue. It's an amazing organ. The tongue and the nose. I really, I'm, I'm quite obsessive about it myself. Like I love to smell things and I love to taste things. You know, when I go for a walk around the woods, I lick, every, lick at the trees. <laughs> 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 
So some, some people hug them, I, I lick them. Uh, no, but seriously though, these organs, these are based on some of the, some of the most primitive sense that we have. Um, it's a chemical recognition system. It's a way of your body understanding the environment, being able to steer the body toward nutrients and steer the body away from toxins. That's what it's designed for. And it's not really, it's evolved, but the basic mechanisms are very much the same in, for example, microbes who have like, you know, detection systems for chemicals to know whether they want to swim this way or this way. So we have this amazing apparatus, which quite often is way more sensitive than any machines. And that's really, really designed for you to be able to find food which is good for you. And what I think we have this huge problem at the moment, of all this chat about food sustainability and about making the world a green place, and nah, 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 nah. it's wonderful. Right, it's great that everyone's talking about it. But actually, there's quite a lot of the world who find that discussion a little bit boring, sadly. So how is it that you can communicate this really, really vitally important concept and to, to people who, who don't see it as very interesting? And I think, actually, by educating people about how to use their tongues and their noses to find really delicious food in their environments, you're going to encourage people to not only uh, eat tasty food, but that food will be in season, it will be local, it will be fresh, because that's the stuff that tastes best. So I think this is actually a huge, huge thing in the development of like sustainable food systems, is really encouraging people to, to use their tongues, to use their noses to the maximum benefit and to enjoy it. And that way you're pushing, pushing, pushing for something sustainable, some kind of decent future, stopping us all falling off this precipice, fighting this war against the industrial systems, but with hedonism, by enjoying it. I'm going to give you two brief examples now of like wild successes of, of kind of regional food systems. Two completely different examples, just to show you how this kind of taste-driven idea can, can uh, improve lives. So I'm working in uh, Copenhagen. It's like there. <laughs> uh, and so what they did there in this restaurant that we're working like quite closely with is, uh, is stop looking at French food and start looking at all the food from the Nordic region. Start looking at all the wild plants and so forth. So this is a colleague or ex-colleague, Trevor, and he's off foraging there for all different wild herbs along the, the shoreline. But that restaurant is a place called Noma. And what they've done by sort of turning the thing around and being like, no, we don't need to cook French food. We can cook uh, food from our region, is they've explored and discovered a whole new set of ingredients, hundreds and hundreds of edible wild plants, different things from the sea, from the massive biodiverse North Sea. Um, different things, different wild animals from the massive forests of Sweden, kind of non-wood forest products and all of this idea. On to my second example. This is Manipur, Northeast India. Pretty unexplored area of India. It's not really on your uh, normal route. And it's a very tribal area with a lot of isolated peoples living in, in, in the hills and valleys. And these tribes, they don't always get on with each other. And one of their main ways of combating each other has traditionally been to block the roads. If you block the roads, nothing gets through. So this happened uh, quite recently. And a roadblock was set up which lasted for almost, uh, well, over three months. As that time went on, people grew increasingly panicked. What were people eating back there, behind this block? Where's the rice? Where's the lentils? Where are the medicines? What's happening? And what was happening? When they broke down the roadblock, finally, after three months, after they felt they'd suffered enough, they went back there and the people went and they said, what's happening, what's happening? And to their surprise, these peoples had just gone back to their old ways. 
They were foraging in the woods, collecting wild herbs for food and for medicine, hunting, sharing in communities. And what I'd like you to think about is if you have one generation, just one generation of these people who live an industrialized food diet, when you have this disruption, like a roadblock, some serious disruption to their, their food security system, one generation of people on industrial food system and all of that knowledge of how to survive with the woods is lost. All of it. You block the road and everyone starves. I'm going to use words of my grandfather again. He said, laughter and happiness are almost as important an element in the attainment of victory as bravery in actual battle. And I think this war against the industrialized food systems actually can be won with laughter and happiness. I think we can win this war using the dinner table. Using the dinner table as the war room. We can win this war against industrialized systems of ridiculous food production. We can win it with community, with conviviality, with sitting around together and enjoying good food, with passing on this knowledge to our children and driving a revolution of food, which is not driven by negativity, it's driven by sharing community and real people sitting around enjoying themselves, enjoying their palates, enjoying their noses, cooking and eating real food. So let's free ourselves from this system. Kali Niki, ke Kali Elefteri. <laughs>